Let's begin the session with a case report. A 37-year-old female reported to the clinic with a characteristic facial asymmetry with various facial expressions on the right side. Personal and medical history was non-contributory. Clinical examination showed an obvious disfiguring facial asymmetry with facial expressions. Upon assessment of the cranial nerves, you notice reduced wrinkling on the frowning of the right side of the forehead. The nose tip was drawn to the left side. When attempting to close the eyes, the patient could not close the affected eye completely with epiphora in the right eye. On smiling and puffing the face, there was a decreased activity of the muscles on the right side of the face compared to that of the left. There was a drooping of the angle of the mouth and drooling saliva from the right side mouth corner. The lab investigations were within normal limits. Magnetic resonance imaging and contrast enhanced computer tomography of the brain reported no abnormalities. You make the provisional diagnosis of Bell's palsy. Now let's exclude the differentials. Stroke. Stroke also affects the extremities on the affected side, which was not seen in this case. Cerebral infarct, which leads to difficulty with speech, paralysis, vision problems, gait problems, all of these were not seen in this case. Pseudobulbar palsy, which is a syndrome of upper motor lesion that affects the corticobulbar system above the brainstem bilaterally. Here, it was only unilateral presentation. Otitis media, it presents with a gradual onset. There is also ear pain, fever and conductive hearing loss. So basically, it's infectious, which was not seen in this case. Multiple sclerosis, forehead spared, demyelination occurs. Additional neurological symptoms are also seen whereas in this case, forehead was affected. Herpes zoster also shows slurred speech, facial drooping pain in the ear and parietal headache. And Ramsey-Hunt syndrome, there is pronounced prodrome of pain with vesicular eruptions in ear canal or pharynx, which were not seen in this case. Looking at the characteristic feature, which provides a clue to the diagnosing in Bell's palsy, which is also known as the palpable oculogyric reflex, which refers to the movement of the eyeballs in an upward direction when the eyelids are forcefully closed. So it was Charles Bell, a great British anatomist, who first observed this phenomenon in 1823 when trying to close the eyelids of a patient with facial palsy. Basically, this phenomenon represents a reflex in which the eyes are seen to roll up and out when both eyelids are forcibly closed. The facial nerve carries the afferent fibers for this reflex while the efferent fibers travel via the oculomotor nerve to the superior rectus muscle that controls upper eyelid movement. In Bell's palsy, this movement is seen because the eyelids fail to close properly. The Bell's phenomenon is important in evaluating facial palsy. In normal people, the eyelids can be squeezed shut such that the eyelashes are buried between the two eyelids. However, only the unaffected eye can complete this action when the facial nerve is injured. On the other hand, the eye on the paralyzed side fails to close properly. In testing the facial nerve function, the strength of the orbicularis muscle is assessed by attempting to open the eyes against resistance. In this situation, Bell's phenomenon is observed. Inflammation of the facial nerve at the geniculate ganglion leading to compression, ischemia and demyelination is believed to cause Bell's palsy or idiopathic facial palsy. Depending on the level of nerve injury, it can be classified as central or peripheral. In the central type, the upper motor neuron lesion, it results in the paralysis of the lower part of the facial muscles on the opposite side of the lesion. The upper facial muscles are normally spared due to bilateral cortical connections. However, in the peripheral type, the lower motor neuron lesion, there is a total facial paralysis on the same side of the lesion. Peripheral lesion produces a more severe type of facial paralysis compared to that of the central lesion, but central lesions may represent serious brain pathologies. A careful history of the onset and progress of paralysis is important. A patient with an acute onset of unilateral facial weakness most likely has Bell's palsy. A gradual onset of more than two weeks duration is strongly suggestive of a mask lesion. Regarding etiology, the most popular hypothesis is viral infection, though it is different from herpes simplex or zoster. 
physiologic compression of the nerve due to arterial spasm, venous congestion or ischemia, narrowing of the bony canal, autoimmune disorders and presence of aberrant facial canal suggest a familial tendency and these are few of the theories put forward regarding its etiology. To identify the level of facial palsy, the house brackman scale is used which is a nerve grading system developed in 1985 by Los Angeles otolaryngologist Dr. John W. House and Dr. Gerald E. Brackman. It is used to characterize the severity of a facial paralysis patient's symptoms. The house brackman classification scores include grade 1 which is normal, grade 2 there is slight facial weakness or other mild dysfunction normal tone and symmetry at rest but complete closure of the eye without effort and slight asymmetry of the mouth when facial movements occur. Grade 3 is assigned to patients dealing with moderate dysfunction. These patients generally do not display any noticeable facial weakness with skininess, with sinkiness, with synkinesis. Grade 3 is assigned to patients dealing with moderate dysfunction. These patients generally do not display any noticeable facial weakness with synkinesis. They maintain complete eye closure and good forehead movement with effort. Grade 4 is assigned to patients dealing with severe dysfunction. So there is obvious facial weakness, incomplete eye closure, no forehead movement, asymmetrical mouth movement and synkinesis. Grade 5 is assigned to patients who have little to no ability to smile, frown or make other facial expressions. The closure of the eye is incomplete and there is no forehead movement. And grade 6, the last one, there is no facial motion at all. A house Brackman score is determined based on measurement of the upper movement of a facial paralysis, patient's eyebrow and the outward movement of the mouth. One point is assigned for every 0.25 cm of motion for both eyebrow and mouth movement with a maximum of 1 cm. The scores are then added together which results in a house Bregman score. The maximum score could be 8. In this instant, a facial paralysis patient's eyebrow and mouth move 1 cm. All house Bregman classification scores are made based on eyebrow and mouth movement on the non-paralyzed side of a patient's face. Regarding treatment, oral corticosteroids have traditionally been prescribed to reduce facial nerve inflammation in patients with Bell's palsy. Prednisone is typically prescribed in a 10-day tapering course starting at 60 mg daily. Because of the possible role of HSV-1, herpes simplex virus 1, in the etiology of Bell's palsy, the antiviral drug acyclovir and valacyclovir have been studied to determine if they have any benefit in treatment. So either acyclovir 400 mg can be given 5 times daily for 7 days or valacyclovir 1 gram thrice daily for 7 days. Depends on the doctor's discretion. However, data are insufficient to support this. Usually Bell's palsy has a high rate of spontaneous recovery. In cases which require surgical management such as decompression within 3 weeks of onset has been recommended for patients who have persistent loss of function say greater than 90% loss on electroneurography at 2 weeks. However, this data is again insufficient to support reasonable benefits. Persistent facial asymmetry and muscular contractures may require cosmetic surgical procedures or botulinum, tox uh, botulinum toxin that is the Botox injections. Patients are often advised to use sunglasses during the day, carboxymethylcellulose, artificial teardrops can be used. You can use night eye patches to prevent corneal abrasions and keratitis. Patients are also advised to avoid dirty noxious fumes. Then there are special physiotherapy exercises which can be done combined with warm water compresses. These are highly effective. A local superficial heat therapy for 15 minutes per session for the facial muscles prior to electrical stimulation has been recommended as a part of physical treatment as well. So this was about Bell's Palsy. I hope you liked the video. Please do like, share, comment and subscribe to the channel. Thank you.